First of all, thank you very much for taking the time to answer some of our questions. Thanks to your work, but also to work from other researchers, it has become clear that wind signaling pathways regulate a variety of different cellular processes. And it has also been clear, become clear that um, there's crosstalk between different wind ligands, receptors, co-receptors, intracellular pathways. When you're looking back, let's say, 10 or 20 years, what would you consider to be the major advances in this field? So, obviously, the discovery of the wind genes were um, the first instrumental um, discovery of a molecular approach towards studying what the role is, because uh, initially a wingless mutant was known to exist in the fly. Um, the name of the entire family wind family derives part of its name um, from this one mutant, wingless, and as the name already would indicate, um, those flies do not form wings. And it was not understood molecularly what um, the basis of um, the mutation or the gene encoded by the effect that um, uh, 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 by, this, by this mutation was. And um, then the molecular cloning revealed that um, the um, protein encoded by this uh, gene is a secreted protein. And that was uh, about the same time that independently um, researchers that worked in a totally different field, namely in uh, cancer biology, identified that um, a gene called INT2 um, was um, the um, uh, encoding another member of uh, this wind gene family. Uh, and it then turned out that um, from these two totally different fields, um, developmental biology in the fly on the one hand, a mouse uh, molecular tumor biology on the other hand, um, all of a the sudden there were two highly related um, genes encoding secreted proteins that then formed the basis of uh, this uh, family of um, wind proteins um, of where there are 19 or so now known to exist in uh, vertebrates. Subsequently, I think um, further steps, um, major advances were the discovery of the first uh, high affinity receptor of the winds, which was um, a seven transmembrane protein of the uh, um, frizzled family uh, members. So we see increasingly emerging of um, this very traditional um, uh, field, developmental biology or embryology, with uh, mainstream uh, molecular biology or um, cell biology. And one of the most uh, recent um, sort of subfields that um, has sprung off is uh, developmental epigenetics, where um, people are realizing that uh, epigenetic mechanisms, not very surprisingly, also are involved in the regulation of um, patterning, proliferation, and so on, that uh, all govern um, how an uh, embryo is um, built. This very nicely leads to my next question. You have recently become interested in these fields in epigenetics, DNA repair, stem cells. You already touched a little bit upon um, how they relate to this uh, field of developmental biology where you originally come from. Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on, on that? So our own approach of how we got into um, epigenetics was uh, really triggered by this um, highly interesting phenomenon of um, cellular reprogramming. Um, initially, this um, were findings um, from the times of uh, John Gurdon pioneering work already in the 50s and 60s, Briggs and King, subsequently by John Gurdon, where he had shown that uh, nuclear transfer um, experiments um, uh, um, can be carried out such that you can clone an organism from a somatic cell uh, uh, nucleus. Initially. Reprogramming, of course, is interesting not just for the sake of cloning um, an, an animal, which has certain applications in, in, in its own right, but it's also highly interesting from a fundamental molecular biological point of view, um, because it was always considered that um, the um, uh, uh, somatic differentiation um, from a pluripotent stem cell into a somatic highly differentiated cell is a one-way street, it's an irreversible process. And um, these types of cloning experiments um, highlighted that, in fact, this is a flexible, um, in principle, flexible, 
process that can also be reversed, not just partly, but almost uh, in, in entirely. And then the questions um, that are associated with that phenomenon are, which are the molecular um, processes that need to be um, reversed in order to um, retain such um, a pluripotent cell state? How do you get from turning off um, pluripotency markers such as OCT4, NANOC, um, which are all turned off in our somatic cells, how do you reactivate them? What are the necessary molecular steps in this? And epigenetics um, uh, seems to play an important uh, part in that because part of the silencing of those proteins and our somatics, of those genes and our somatic cells that leads to the shutoff of protein function um, is, for example, through DNA methylation. And DNA methylation is commonly associated with the um, silencing of um, uh, uh, gene loci. And that's one of the aspects that need to be reversed during uh, the reprogramming. The methylated pluripotency genes need to be demethylated. And um, demethylation um, of uh, cytosine marks um, has been a process that um, has been very controversial over the years. There were a number of um, uh, examples in the literature um, that um, indicated that there is a um, DNA demethylase but the molecular mechanism by which such a DNA demethylase would act that may then also be involved in the reprogramming of uh, pluripotency genes. The molecular nature of such a demethylase was um, entirely unclear. Um, there were some hints of how this could work, but sufficiently novel territory, terra incognita, if you wish, that we decided that even though we were traditionally working for uh, many years on wind signaling, that this is a uh, and totally uh, unresolved and therefore highly interesting question in one of the maybe the last um, big questions of um, epigenetics um, that uh, we said let's try to have a look with the tools, the types of approaches that, um, that we master. If we cannot get a handle on the molecular nature of such a DNA demethylase and we were able to uh, clone out um, a gene called GUT45 which um, uh, is able to promote such a DNA demethylation. And um, then it turned out that this um, protein may function via a DNA repair process that is then eliminating um, this uh, methylated cytosine, thereby leading to DNA demethylation. In 1961, I think uh, uh, William Asbury described molecular biology as an approach to search for the molecular plan underlying the large-scale manifestations of classical biology. Now you, as a developmental biologist by training from your background, you're now the founding director of this Institute of Molecular Biology. Would you say that molecular biology is a discipline in its own right or that it is more of an approach, as of a way of studying questions in, for example, developmental biology? Mm -hmm. Molecular biology is um, probably a field that has um, evolved from initially a field in its own right. Um, if we think about the early days of molecular biology, um, that sort of was at the interface of biochemistry and uh, gene regulation, um, and has evolved more and more to encompass uh, many other fields such that um, nowadays um, some people could say that um, uh, molecular biology is actually more um, a, an array of techniques of experimental approaches that is, that is unifying various um, subfields of um, biology that all make use of molecular biology um, as a technique to understand what are the genes the gene products involved in a given uh, process, be it at cell biology, be it um, at um, uh, organismic biology. Um, there's a unifying theme of um, how to experimentally approach that, and that unifying theme seems to be um, molecular biology. I would not go as far as uh, some um, to say that molecular biology is just a compendium of techniques nowadays. I think there's also still at the very heart of molecular biology to understand how um, the gene works, what are genes, um, how are they regulated. When you're 
starting up a brand new institute from scratch, if you will, is it better to keep the research focus broad or to focus more on one or two specific areas? What was your approach when thinking of what kind of researchers to recruit to Mainz? But we decided to keep a relatively circumscribed, um, narrow research focus um, such that the researchers that are going to be hired and that are already hired and will soon join will have um, a common interest in those issues such as um, development, developmental epigenetics, um, DNA damage or related um, technologies that would support this type of research. Um, in order to maximize also the interactions, the possibilities of uh, interactions, uh, and to maximize also the um, possibility between uh, the colleagues at the IMB that um, they have a neighbor that will understand what they are working on, mm -hmm. um, that will take a genuine interest in um, their uh, mutual research um, topics, and um, in the ideal case that interact um, by uh, collaborations. You've been a member of EMBO since 1999, I think, mm -hmm. so you have quite some time to get to know the organization. How and where does EMBO or an organization such as EMBO play a role in European science, but also from a more global perspective? Nowadays, EMBO, of course, has um, many uh, um, missions beyond just giving um, uh, EMBO fellowships um, that I enjoyed. But uh, nowadays, um, EMBO is um, organizing many courses, symposia, workshops. Um, they are organizing um, um, science policy related uh, um, uh, activities. Um, they have a number of journals uh, that they are running. So these are many of the different facets that EMBO has evolved into um, um, in taking also the responsibility of integrating the various um, facets that modern biology um, uh, uh, has and needs to um, integrate all those different fragmented uh, national activities that are going on in the various European countries and um, uh, uh, focusing them in one organization so that um, our colleagues from the different member countries can all speak with one voice. And I think that is very important to be heard and um, therefore EMBO has an important role, not just uh, to the science uh, community directly, to foster them, but also to be the representation of all of them towards uh, science policy makers, towards the uh, EU, but also towards the national science policy makers uh, uh, to give recommendations of where things should move and how uh, resources should be allocated uh, and uh, uh, taking certain policy decisions. But it's not only, I think, not only important in, 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 in a European context, but also more globally. I mean, of course, Asia and, and the United States or North America um, um, are very important, of course. So one of the, um, one of the criticisms that, um, for example, in American politics um, um, towards Europe is often raised is, Whenever I want to speak, says um, um, the foreign minister of the United States, whenever I want to speak um, to a representative of foreign policy in Europe, I have no telephone number to call anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think um, EMBO is at least one such telephone number for the biology or biomedical field that uh, somebody from the United States, from Asia or from um, other countries that are interested in uh, making contact with um, the community at large, they can contact and they will find at EMBO um, um, people that have the uh, mandate um, to uh, answer questions, to get uh, certain collaborations off the ground um, and uh, being a representative um, that uh, 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 has the, the backing of the entire uh, community. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome.